This is Friday, June 12th. We're starting quite late. Um, we had three issues to discuss today. We're gonna get as far as we can. Um, the first issue that we're gonna talk about has to do with um, the, bill, the language that we sent to appropriations yesterday regarding use of uh, the COVID relief funds and uh, the, the, the language we sent related to our uh, public pre-K uh, 12 programs as well as our public colleges of higher learning. Um, since then, we've been approached by the independent schools as well as the independent colleges. Um, had, uh, Representative Coopley, uh, Conlon and I have been working to try to figure out how we might address the independent colleges. Um, there are a couple of documents. Um, Avery, I'm not sure if you have the, the documents. Did I send those to you? One that showed the number, the, the list of independent um, schools. Somebody has that. Avery, did I send that to you? I'm not sure um, if I have that. I can definitely look around for it. Um, so a list of independent schools. Yeah. Um. Not, I think I can actually share it. I might even be able to pull it up. <laughs> Avery, I just sent, sent it to you. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. That was the information rep rep from Chloe, right? Um, there was a list that we got from, from Chloe. There was also one that we got from, um, that I got from Mill Moore. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. I, I just sent uh, Avery the one from Chloe. Okay. For the financial analysis. I'm gonna see if I can bring this up or not. Um, all right, finally figured out how to do this. Can you see this? Is the document showing up for everybody? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, the independent schools reached out to us. And um, as I said, Representative Coopley and Conlon and I worked on how we might address our independent um, schools in relation to uh, uh, COVID relief funds. So I asked them to let us know, um, to, to send us information on their independent non-sectarian schools and what the numbers were as well in relation to those that are uh, publicly tuitioned to those schools. This is the data that we got. And um, what you can see, there are some that are NEASC, it's not called NEASC anymore, it's called something else, I forgot what it's called, but it's the accreditation, accrediting agency. Um, there are, uh, as you can see at the bottom, the total enrollment and then the number of students that are, that are publicly tuitioned. And then over on those that are approved by the State Board of Education, um, so we started a conversation, we looked at a variety of, of options and we realized that maybe the best way that we could do this um, is to use a document that, uh, that looked at the potential costs of, um, of, ed of the students returning to school that, that um, Secretary French gave us the other day. And we asked Brad to take a look at that and see, uh, Brad and Chloe to look at that and see if there's a way that perhaps we can, we can um, help, up our, help out our independent schools who are, um, who are hosting our tuition publicly tuition students in those schools um, on a per pupil basis based on enrollment. So Brad and Chloe, can I ask you, I'll, I'll, get stop sharing my screen. Are there any questions about this? First of all, we are very limited time. <laughs> um, so now I have to figure out how to not share this. Okay, maybe Chloe, you can unshare it for me. I mean, um, let's see, here we go. 
So Brad and Chloe, I'm not sure who was prepared to give us an idea on how we might count these students. Um, I, I, I can go unless Chloe has a burning desire to go first. Okay. Um, for the record, Brad James Agency of Education, which I usually forget to do when we're online. Um, there, when Secretary French was speaking with you the other day, I don't remember what it was, um, he had a document from the uh, National Association of Superintendents that kind of did what, what they anticipated an average cost to be, or cost to be to reopen a school for an average school. They have certain parameters. And that, that number came out to about one, off the top of my head, 1.7, 1.8 million. I think, I think that you, that we sent that to you. Avery, do you have that one? It's the one, um, look at the website to see what it's called, because I don't remember. I have too much open. Um, on the wrong day, of course. Is this the correct document? Let me go back and look now, because I, yes, that's it. Okay, um, so what 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 the what they did along with the National Association of Business Managers or business officials is they came up with what they thought were going to be costs. And up at the top it says their that they their average school district does not apply to Vermont. Their average school district was over thirty six hundred students with eight school buildings, one hundred eighty three classrooms, and three hundred twenty nine staff members and forty school buses. Using that, they came up with all these numbers down below as to what they thought they would they would require. And when you go through the rigmarole of putting it all together and then dividing by the number of pupils, I think it comes out to $484, $485 per pupil um, is what it does. So we figured this was a reasonable starting point to look at what the cost would be for the independent schools to reopen also, because they're going to have the same type issues that the public schools are going to have. When you look at this, the, you, the, the I, I think pretty much they all, um, they all, um, relate to the independent schools, except for the last one, which is providing transportation and childcare. And, and that, that amount um, adds up to a total of just over $235,000. And so if we exclude that and then sum up the rest of them, it comes out to be about $1.54 million. Um, Chloe, or Avery, could you pull up the other document now, please, that has the numbers on it? And that's the one I'll be referencing now. Thank you. Um, if, if you just go, I'll go to the top at first. So, so there, 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 there are the parameters that you just saw just in a different format that you saw on that other sheet of paper right there. There are the numbers for the students and such. Um, actually, a little bit bigger was better. One more, there you go. Um, and then it, I just, I, those, those are the numbers. So, so now if you'd scroll down a little bit so that number eight, line number eight is on the top, please, Avery. Yep, that's good, that's perfect, okay. So what, what line eight is is that total that I was just mentioning to you. If you back out the childcare and the transportation, that leaves about one point four million dollars. Um, currently, the numbers that I had, and 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 I'll explain this in a second. The numbers that I had for the most recent numbers that I have for um, publicly funded students at independent schools in Vermont was just about two two thousand eight hundred thirty. That's an FY nineteen number. I have not seen current year numbers yet. Um, but looking at what was just put up there. Um, by, by Representative Webb, it's that, that, that number is 2712, 2712. We'll come back to that in a second. Working with that 2830 number that you're looking at right there, if I was to figure out, okay, what proportion of that is that of what was called an average school, that's his line 10 now, then we, we take the 2830 and divide it by the average number of students, for, which is 3659, and that's just over 77%. If I take the 77% of 77% of that $1.5 million I'm in line 11 now, then that comes out to just about $1.2 million that, that you know, on a, on a per pupil basis. Dividing that roughly $1.2 million, now we're in line 12, by the number of students that I used, 2,830, it would be $422 per student. Rounding that puts it at 420. And so down below, we're at 420 per publicly funded student at the independent schools in Vermont. And again, we're talking about just this, just the students in the state of Vermont, um, or in, in schools that are in the that are in Vermont independent schools. 
So when you do that multiplication, you come out with $1.18 million that the cost would be. If I was to go back in to the file right now and replace that 2,830 number with the 20, 2,712 number that Representative Webb just showed us, you would come out with the exact same result because the proportion would change, therefore the total would change, the per pupil amount it would stay the same. It would it'd all be proportional. So that number down there is, is what we came up with based on this logic. Um, Representative Conlon and, um, and, and Coopley and I also spoke with uh, independent schools earlier today. Um, they of course would like to have the same, uh, the, the, the same program that we used for the, uh, um, for the public schools, however, they would pretty much lose out on um, on the 2021 because it's that's Title One based. Um, so this was an approach that we thought at least could give them access um, to some funds. And I see Kathleen, who represents an area that has a significant independent school. Um, did you have a question or a comment, Kathleen? I did, um, more than one, significant independent schools, actually. Um, what about reimbursement um, for COVID costs already incurred? Um, Peter Conlon, you had a, a good response to that, I think. What was our, do you remember what our thinking was on that? Uh, I think that what we were looking at was the fact that they have access to ESSER funds for no. that. No, no. Oh, we're talking, no. About, okay. That's not, uh, can, I, can, I just, can I just jump in for a clarification yeah, point? Yeah. You brought that up, Representative Conlon. Um, the, independent, the independent schools do not have access to the ESSER funds directly. What, what the CARES Act clearly states is that um, they, ESSER schools may get equitable service money from, from the public schools in terms of ESSER. That, but otherwise, yes, it's going to the public schools. The, the money we're talking about here is the coronavirus relief fund, the CRF money, um, which has okay. more, more stringent restrictions. All right. Well, then I'll speak to my, my broader point right. and issue here, uh, which is that um, uh, what we don't know is did these independent schools spend money above and beyond what they had budgeted to spend for the year? Uh, in other words, were there added costs, if they had any, offset by their savings by not offering everything that is spring related, by laying off employees, and by not having to pay for contracts for services that uh, they needed through the end of the year? Um, uh, and so, you know, I guess my feeling with providing funds to independent schools. I don't necessarily have a philosophical objection to it, but I do think it can't be done without oversight to make sure that there were costs incurred above and beyond what they had budgeted. And same thing for FY21. Um, or can they demonstrate that um, funds provided will result in easing of pressure on the education fund, which is of course the public school goal by lowering tuition to public um, towns that, that tuition their kids to these schools. So in other words, I think that, you know, in order to qualify for this money and apply for it and qualify for it, there's got to be some books that are opened uh, to show that this money is needed and would not create a surplus. Um, you know, in our, in our uh, proposal, we talk about any surplus created by corona, um, corona relief funds um, has to be returned to the education fund. So I think the same rule should apply for um, independent schools. Um, I, I think that that's about it. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit complicated. I, I definitely recognize that. I wanna let people know that this is kind of our last chance to get something in for the independent schools. The language that we have, the amount of money that we put forward in the Appropriations Committee, um, the Senate is doing a whole lot um, 
with those funds there there and and I don't know what's going to happen with with the approach there but there's nothing that we have at this point that recognizes the independent um, school so this was an opportunity to at least say we are going to make sure you have access to these funds um, I, I was seeing this as a, a reimbursement model up to um, what you would have received for the number of students that you have at the school based on, on a, a, a set amount per student that's um, on public tuition. Um, so that's what we have at the moment. And I sort of either have to get this out if there's major, major revisions, um, I guess you'll have to get to me um, now. I, I suppose it's possible over the weekend. Um, we're, we're out of time is our problem. We were asked to spend $50 million in uh, 48 hours and sort of the, the boat is sailing. <laughs> so um, Peter, come on. Yeah. Uh, so um, Kate, I would just say that, you know, I, I think that uh, putting in a provision is um, appropriate. Uh, I, you know, using a formula like this, I think is probably the best we're going to be able to do. Um, I don't know if the per pupil one is the right. I, I can't. I was, I was in the middle of something when Brad was speaking, and I, I assume Brad, you spoke to um, the fact that there are services that uh, independent schools don't provide that may be in that 400. And, I guess it was a higher number. So I, I assume you took that into account. I can as uh, not not really because reading reading through the criteria that that the that the people who did this came in it was it was really about what are they going to need for for schools and such um, in terms of open okay. not necessarily service provided to students outside of protective equipment and such yeah well then I, you know I'm comfortable with this um, as long as it has the same language that we're holding public schools to and that is that. Uh, um, that any surplus created by CRF funds um, revert to the education fund. So if you look at what we're spending, um, just, just to do some fuzzy math, if we set aside 45 million for both years and how many, we have what, 80,000? Students, that's $560 a student for the two years. So just keep that in perspective. Um, that's it's about 80, is it 80,000? Oops, you're muted. I, yeah, I, th I, I get, again, I haven't looked at these numbers. I would say it's closer to 85, probably 87,000, somewhere in that range. Okay. And, and you know, when we're talking about all the students. Yeah. So that would be less. So if we had, we took the forty five million, <laughs> Chloe would do this all in her head, and it's eighty five thousand <laughs> students. That would be five hundred and twenty nine dollars per student. Nope. Did I just do some fuzzy math? <laughs> Kathleen, are you are you comfortable? Yeah, I just have a question and a comment. Okay. Um, the one thing I didn't understand, the reason I asked about reimbursement for COVID expenses already incurred was that I couldn't tell from the way this is structured whether they the money can't be used for that. It can only be used for reopening costs. That was what I was confused about. No, I, th I think that we can make it, uh, I think we can make it cover both. Okay. I think we was... can make it. Yeah, we can make it eligible. I think, Jim, we talked about that. We can make it eligible for 2020 with the ability to carry it forward. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, I, Peter, I totally, I take your point. I, the, I guess I just want to get in a pitch here that, um, at least in my district, independent schools are a really vital part of our educational landscape. And if, if we don't help them, we are missing out on a huge chunk of students. And so I just, I see this is very important. I know it's late, but um, you know, we're missing out on a, on a major chunk of our student population here if we don't help the schools that serve them. Uh, and and I, I don't object to that 
at, at all. Um, they, they, this is, these are vital institutions. Um, I'm just saying that uh, we, we just approved $70 million um, on the floor today for businesses who can demonstrate that they have lost 75% of their revenue. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, 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 and we are saying that public schools, if a surplus is created with these funds, it has to revert to the ed fund. So I just think that the same criteria needs to apply here. I understand. Fair, fair is fair. And there's always always the possibility if we ever get to some tier two that they could come in and talk about the other students that are that are there, the, the other 5,000 students. Yeah, Larry Coopley. Brad, um, in terms of returning, Peter, um, as well, in terms of returning that surplus to the Ed Fund from the independent schools who do not report their finances per, for the most part, how do we ensure that that happens? I, the, only, the only way I can see it is if their books are open for us to, to see what's going on. That, I, I, don't, I don't know how to, how to look at it any other way um, because we would, we would have to see what their costs are um, and compared to how much money they're getting. That's, I, I, I'm not sure, I had, I've not thought that part through. We're gonna to have to move on. It has to yeah. be really whether we can support um, where we're going. I, I don't know if Jim, if you put it into language or not. Uh, I can put it into language. Um, we're talking about appropriation for fiscal year 20 that can carry over to fiscal year 21. Yes. Uh, the surplus, I'm a little bit concerned about the surplus just because it's not a public school and all the rules on surplus that we have are for public schools. Right. Um, so do they meet the surplus? If they if they're putting in if if they're they're putting in their expenses, um, who's carrying the surplus? It just stays in the fund in well, AOE, it's doesn't possible it? Possible that the use of um, uh, CRF funds could create a surplus because it could be used right. for a payroll that was already budgeted. Um, it, it, it can, can be used for that purpose if the employee was redeployed to deal with COVID-19 matters. So because you have a budget expense that's not being covered by um, this federal funding, you can, it can create a surplus. And that's, that's where we have the issue in our world now. Mm -hmm. But uh, for private schools, I guess the same is, is true, but our whole infrastructure on surplus is designed around public schools. So I don't know what issues that will throw up to, you know, require them to carry a surplus in the next year and to reduce that. Our, our mechanism is we reduce ed fund payments. But we don't make ed fund payments to private schools. So, so the whole mechanism doesn't quite work the same way. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure how to do that. Okay. Well, I think we're just gonna have to figure that out. Um, not now. Um, a committee, are we, can we move this along? Yeah, I, I certainly have no objection to moving it along, uh, Madam Chair. I think time is of the essence and in all fairness, I think it, you know, I think it's a fair proposal. Okay, is there anybody opposed to that? As, as far as I'm concerned, as long as there's the same oversight, uh, I'm, I'm fully in favor. And we'll, we'll sort out the- And we'll sort that out later, absolutely. Yeah. And again, this is this is not done. This is not going into law tomorrow. Right. This is good. This has got a ways to go. Okay. Thank you, um, Jim. We can talk talk later. Um, maybe we can how out on on Monday and try to get that sorted okay. out with Brad and Chloe and Mark. Figure that out. All right, so let's take this down. Um, I want to see if we can just do the, um, if we can quickly do the chart of accounts, because then I want to be able to, and I hope people can stay longer than our, our time so we can at least get a, a basic start on the, the challenges with the designated agencies. So is, um, I'm sorry here is, I'm looking for Bill Bates here. 
I am, if I can just uh, yeah. turn my, my mute off. Okay. So we're, there was a question in, um, there was a question in appropriations about whether it was possible to use uh, CRF funds to help the schools along in relation to implementing the charter, the universal charter of accounts, which brought the question, where are we with the universal charter of accounts? And two, uh, would this be an appropriate use of, of, of CRF funding for schools to bring everybody up to speed on that faster? It's an appropriations question. I'm seeing Brad's face. <laughs> <laughs> So I think if we could just get an get an idea on where we are with the chart of accounts, how far do we have to go, and what are the impediments? And we do have some business managers in the room. Excellent. So uh, for the record, Bill Bates uh, Agency of Education and uh, Avery, I had uh, shared with uh, <clears throat> Suzanne a, a PowerPoint, and I don't know if we want to share that with the uh, the entire committee. Okay, see if we can we can get the, the high level here. Absolutely. So the way that I like to uh, report out on projects is what I call a uh, project roll forward. So it takes you from uh, why are we doing this? Where have we been? Where are we currently at? And where are we headed? I'm not going to, given the uh, shortness of time, go slide by slide, but uh, given your question as to where we're at. If we can jump ahead to uh, slide 13. I'm sorry, slide 12. Slide 12 is our deployment schedule. And what you can see here, if I can uh, clear my screen, here are all of the rounds, and then you can also see the baseline live date in uh, column four. And we've highlighted or shaded in, in gray round five, about uh, two thirds of the way down the uh, page. That is where we're going to be at as of July of 2020. So we will have 35% of all of the SUSDs implemented by July 2020. And then you've got uh, round six, round seven, and round eight that follow. So by the uh, end of July 21, we'll be at 65% implemented. Round seven, January 22, we'll be at 80% and then 100% at uh, the end of July of 22. That's based on the current schedule. The other That's thing the that schedule. I'll... I'm sorry. That's the schedule. What's the reality? That that is the schedule. That's where we're at currently. We uh, we are on schedule to uh, complete those five SUs SDs for uh, July of 2020. What we have uh, done as a project team, if we can go to slide 13, here is a roadmap that shows where we're headed. So we have implemented version 1911. Then we have worked with Power School to come up with additional uh, releases, so version 20, version 21. And I won't talk through all the detail, but you can see that we're uh, we're making headway into implementing many of the deliverables that uh, are in the contract. So that's that's the project. What uh, what I think uh, your question leads to is where are we at with uh, the 85 items that have uh, been requested by the uh, business managers, the LEAs. 28 of those are contract related. So Power School is on the hook to implement those according to the contract that we have with them. There is another 57 system enhancements that uh, the uh, business managers have identified and asked us to scope out. And so we need to figure out how to pay for those if we were to implement them. And I think that's that's the question that you're asking. Yes, all the, all the focus right now is related to um, would COVID funds 
help in this process in in bringing it forward? And yeah. would it uh, would they potentially be something that would meet criteria? And Brad, correct me if I'm wrong. Given the uh, restrictive nature of the uh, CRF funds, I don't see that these uh, system enhancements would meet the definition. But uh, I'll defer to you, Brad. No, I, I agree with you, and and, and Representative Webb was correctly reading my face when she first when she was first <laughs> talking about that. Although I was on mute, um, no, I I don't I don't think that these would meet the criteria for the CRF. No. So even though you've, and I'm now trying to translate from the Appropriations Committee, um, because you've asked uh, school districts to code for, for CRF funds, um, they, they were thinking that perhaps, uh, that perhaps that would, would make them a, a CRF eligible. I, 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 if I may Region. step on everybody's toes, I think, I think that'd be a stretch. Um, because it, that's just simple uh, accounting. Um, it, well, the business manager probably tell me it's not simple, but it, 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 it's, it's just a, it, putting things in a, in a different code. It, it's, I don't think it's any different than any other code. So I think it'd be hard pressed to say that there's really a significant cost involved with that. I think, and, and again, the, the other AOE people who know more about this than I do, I think we're really kind of talking about two things, the chart of accounts, and then there's the implementation of the system that's going to be running the chart of accounts, and Bill's kind of addressing that. Yeah, um, and and, it, and that's what that timeline was that he was showing, and, and and putting money towards it is not going to move that timeline forward. Okay. Nope. Then then I think we're done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really the whole purpose, Sarita. Um, yes, I was just wondering. I didn't know if I missed an email or something. I'm just not. I. I guess if we're done, we're fine. I just needed a little bit more context about what we're talking about here. So well, we're, if we're done, yeah. we're, if we're done. It's so. really only to answer a question uh, that, the, it, that the Appropriations Committee asked to move the chart of accounts along because they're very interested in it. Um, and because what, you're what starting the, to ask- what are, what are the charted accounts? We're not, we'll, we'll okay. deal with that later. That's just trying okay. to get everybody on the same bill, billing billing plan okay yeah okay. Yep. sorry that I'm I, I we're just so pressed for time I'm yeah I'm, I just didn't know if we're making a decision and I no. really yeah felt like okay. no we're done okay <laughs> we're done <laughs> thank and you I it, this is this is not the way we like to do business in our committee that's for sure okay thank you so then uh, we're moving on to the other topic, which is another, another question that came from appropriations. And that was related to some challenges that we're hearing from the designated agencies. And um, perhaps um, the designated agencies, the, the connection between um, the designated agency and schools um, comes, I believe, from Act 264. Um, if I have that, that correct, that uh, allows uh, access to um, the designated agencies to help schools with children um, who have um, uh, special ed and mental health challenges. Is that correct? Do I have that correct? You might be a good person to tell us exactly what. what Hi, Representative Chair Webb. This is Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of the Department oh, of Mental Health. There we Health. go. Thank um, you. You're the perfect person. <laughs> yeah. So just to jump in and to provide a little bit of context. So what yeah. we're talking about is Success Beyond Six. Um, that was a fiscal mechanism that was put into place in the early 90s um, that allows for school mental health agencies, um, school mental health services through the DAs to provide school-based mental health services um, to uh, local schools and students. Um, it's a very um, creative fiscal mechanism by which the local education agencies use their local match dollars to actually draw down the Department of Mental Health's Medicaid dollars. So essentially that, what that means is for every dollar's worth of service, uh, the local LEA puts up 40 cents and then we're able to draw down the 60 cents of the DMH Medicaid, um, which greatly reduces the cost to the schools and allows us um, to provide exceptional school-based mental health services across the state of Vermont. Obviously the impact of COVID-19, which drastically and quickly shifted um, the provision of services um, has uh, caused some challenges. I have to say our community mental health agencies immediately leaned in 
um, to really work creatively um, to ensure that our youngest children and youth were able to continue to access services. As you can imagine, now more than ever, with the pressure of um, you know, remote learning, um, isolation, you know, we think the social, emotional, and behavioral needs of children and youth um, are significant, are urgent, and important. Um, and as everyone on this committee is aware, um, many young children, um, school is their safe place. Um, they access some of their most nourishing relationships um, through their schools. And so we have worked very, very hard to try to ensure that even though it has to be delivered a little bit differently, and we had to think really creatively, um, that we want to ensure that children, youth, and families continue to access those services. I could try to summarize quickly um, what I think the issue is. I guess the problem that we're trying to solve, if you will, is that the Department of Mental Health, um, we have a lot of flexibility um, in, our, in our Medicaid, um, which is we've moved towards a case rate. You know, that's kind of where healthcare is moving in terms of payment reform. Um, so the designated agencies have a case rate for the provision of their other mental health services. Um, Success Beyond Six has remained um, somewhat of a fee-for-service program. Um, so in order um, to, when COVID-19 hit, in order to ensure that we could continue the provision of services, continue to support our designated agencies, to make sure that we could retain our staff, because we all know that the mental health needs of children and youth are only going to increase, um, mm -hmm. the Department of Mental Health put into place an emergency case rate. Um, so that our school partners could continue to provide services in a much more flexible way. Obviously here at the Agency of Human Services, uh, DIVA, DMH, we've also worked um, to allow um, telephonic supports, uh, freeing up flexibilities and billing so that um, more telephonic supports could be offered. Mm -hmm. Um, and we tried to move quickly because we wanted to stabilize the system, which we've all been doing, right? We want to stabilize our essential health care provider. Um, the, the issue that has emerged is that um, a portion of our local schools, not all, but some, um, have been contemplating um, canceling or reducing um, those contracts because there is some worry um, that they will not be reimbursed um, by the Agency of Education. Um, so while we have all this flexibility under the Department of Mental Health's Medicaid case rate, schools are concerned that um, they won't be fully reimbursed for the same kind of flexibility that we have, um, which then results in if the designated agency doesn't have the local match coming from the school, we can't draw down the Medicaid. There's a huge gap fiscally for the designated agencies and then we kind of put the provision of services at risk. Um, so I, I have to give kudos um, to leadership at the Agency of Education because they have been trying to work very closely with the Department of Mental Health um, on potential solutions, um, but the, the guidance um, and the review that the Agency of Education has done has concluded that there are some limitations in terms of what the special ed reimbursement dollars can cover and possibly can't be used as flexibly um, as we have contemplated um, the continuation of services. So that puts the designated agencies in a really tough position um, because what they're doing now, um, because we're committed to continuing services um, to these children and youth, is where there are gaps, where schools are saying, no, we're only gonna pay you for this 15 minutes or this 15 minutes the designated agencies are actually having to come up with their own match dollars so that we can draw down the full amount of Medicaid, which of course is putting pressure on their overall budgets um, in an already stressful time. Um, we also had contemplated at the Department of Mental Health possibly continuing the case rate, but of course fiscally we can't do that responsibly um, if we can't assure that we're going to have those match payments from the local schools. Um, so we want to look more long term at the potential of a case rate, um, but in the, sh in the short term, you know, without um, some assurance that or opportunity to kind of work with AOE and the LEAs, um, that really becomes challenging for us. Um, so right now we are actually looking at potentially um, the healthcare stabilization package that the Agency of Human Services is working on 
as we go forward, there may be an opportunity to utilize some of those dollars to stabilize the system. Again, that's a you know kind of a short-term, mid-term approach, um, but those are some of the pieces that we're contemplating right now. And we do worry, of course, um, because we want to assure that we can retain our workforce. We want to support the capacity of the designated community mental health agencies because we know come fall, we're going to need them. Um, so I think that's where we are right now. I know there's a lot of folks on this call that, um, and particularly with the DAs that can also articulate what that looks like and feels like on the ground to them. Um, but certainly the Department of Mental Health is committed to finding a path forward, but because it's a shared funding stream, we have to do it collaboratively with AOA, our agency of education and our local education agencies. Well, given that we have a lot of federal funds hanging around here, it seems that somehow we should be able to find some kind of a solution that's, that, that can work. Um, why don't we hear from, so I see we've got Laurel, Laurel's here. Did you want to want to add anything at this point or shall we go on to the, to Bob Beck and Mary Moulton? I think Sarah covered it for DMH, so it's okay. fine to move on, thank you. Okay, um, Mary Moulton, you represent Washington County Mental Health and understand that you are experiencing some challenges related to this funding. So welcome. Please help us identify the problem. I also, I need to unmute myself. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for having us here and, and giving us this opportunity. So for the record, Mary Moulton, Executive Director of Washington County Mental Health Services. Uh, just reiterating what Commissioner Squirrel said around the maintenance of our workforce when this occurred with COVID, you know, we really shifted that workforce to uh, remote and we began to see increasing need from these kids who are extremely vulnerable and their families as well. So we did such things as setting up food sites getting out to homes, doing social distancing, being able to at least see the family, see the child inside, have some exchange, uh, and then continue um, again anytime there were incidences or needs. Um, our schools, we really appreciate, and they appreciate the work that we do, but they obviously see a difference between a BI that is seven and a half hours in a school system by a child's side, helping them to access their education every day to this shift that we all did. And so our, what uh, I would just add to what Commissioner Squirrel said is that, yes, these dollars are used and they are, they are used then um, through a contractual arrangement that is made between the designated agency and the school system. And so um, as, as we did the shift and we supported kids just as schools did, uh, we began to hear concerns from the schools about the ability um, to be able to um, be reimbursed for services and pay. So what I, I just like to share is I think that the, the playing field out there is, is a little different in different areas as Sarah said and so while the guidance came out and the commissioner and secretary of education provided guidance around the CARES Act would call for you to maintain your staff and maintain your contracts. There was a line within the guidance that said, and we do recognize that if there is a change in frequency and duration that you could, sh you could, um, you know, um, alter your contracts, look at them differently. There was a suggestion through that language that said two things, maintain and also we recognize there's a difference. With that, different areas around the state have approached this problem in different ways. And so for example, very quickly, Lamoille County has experienced their supervisory union saying, well, that tells us we should pay and they have paid. Um, for the um, full year. Um, there are some discussions going on in different parts of the state, and I'll let my colleagues speak to this about, well, we'd like to pay, but we're not sure how, and we really need to look at whether we'll be in reimbursed um, under our, the current contracts. And in my area in Washington County, um, our, um, we, we have heard um, our contracts are null and void. And so um, given the fact that we have had this major event, we really need to shift to fee for service 
and only for the IEP related services as Commissioner Squirrel indicated, those little 15 minute increments while we may be doing you know, two hours, three hours or more for a kid in crisis during the day at their home or remotely as we would have in school, that's not able to be recognized um, in our discussions. That's being called into question as to whether that should be a mental health side of the house issue at this point because we're not together in this physical building in the school system. So different areas are interpreting um, their issues around budgets, certainly, which we respect because this will cause a major shift in our budgetary pressures as well as indicated. And you know, for Washington County, that's $2.9 million in a, in, a, in a quarter totaled up in contracts. And that um, given the match is 1.4 million in general fund, but it's, it, do, it does hit us double because we're gonna have to buy our own match if this mm -hmm. happens. And you know, what was a good year will put us in the hole. It, it's just a, it's a tremendous um, problem for the designated agency system. And I think I'll, I'll cede to others or to questions to um, Bob Bick or Todd Bauman from Northwest Counseling, who has also joined us on the call today. So let me just ask you, so if uh, we have a student who's identified uh, for these services in an IEP or, or whatever, um, you have been very often, I would imagine these are students that are also on special ed extraordinary costs. Yes. Very often. So it's, it's also tied to special ed dollars. Yes. And so it's the special ed dollars that are being used to match. Yeah, yes. Success or, beyond or, six. Yeah. Yes. With their um, special ed dollars. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about a student, for example, that maybe was a seven and a half, seven and a half hours um, of service per week, I think you said. Per day um, in a school per system. Day. Okay, so this is a one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. Um, so you have a one-on-one -on -one who was in the school seven and a half hours a day, helping them access programs and move through the building and whatever it was that they needed. Um, and now the schools are closed and now they're providing services, but it's not seven and a half hours a day. It might be more acute management of mm -hmm. behavior from a phone call, or it could be it could be a variety of things that might. That's so, so the seven and a half day now becomes a, so seven and a half day becomes seven and a half hours a week. Could very well be, yes. Could very, be, very well be. Yep. And the schools are reimbursing you for the, for the actual fee for service. We, well, it's not a fee for service contract. So our contracts are for the bundle of services. So, bundle, yeah. Yeah. So for us, what we've said is we'd be we'd be pleased to cut to discuss what concessions we could make within the mm -hmm. contract. Okay. But what we are receiving is it has to be a fee for service only for specific delivery and of IEP related services. That's from your school. That's from your school district at this point, Correct. but not necessarily Correct. from the AOE. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, why don't we hear? We have two other. Um, designated agencies here. Why don't we listen from those two um, committee members? Can we can we go until five? I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> um, it might it might be less than that because we we don't have many folks from the we don't. Uh, I think Brad, you're the only one here from the Agency of Education, and I'm pretty sure you're not prepared to. <laughs> do this one. We're supposed to have Emily Simmons. And Avery, if you could reach out and see if if, um, if Heather Boucher and Emily could join us later that we're meeting now, um, rather than earlier, see if they can come join us as well. Um, so why don't we hear from, let's hear from uh, Bob Beck in Chittenden County. Thanks. Sorry, we're keeping everybody late on a beautiful Friday afternoon. Yeah, we kept you late. <laughs> well, I have to admit, um, the disruption actually worked for me because my granddaughter was graduating at CVU and I got to watch the event live stream. So I would not have been able to do that if we met earlier. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. any, anyway, um, 
For the record, I'm Bob Bick. I'm the CEO with the Howard Center. Um, I just want to reinforce exactly what Commissioner Squirrel and, and Mary have said in terms of the scope of the issue. Um, I don't need to repeat it. I think the issues are identical here in Chittenden County. Um, we have had, as have the other um, DAs, incredibly collaborative and cooperative relationships with our schools for a long time. Um, and I think part of the challenge is the, um, the communication that came from AOE. This is not meant to lay blame at the feet of AOE. I think they were doing the best that they could to um, identify the issues as they viewed them, um, but it has um, created a challenge. And, um, you know, given our size, we're talking about school contracts, which for us, you know, see $10 million. It's a big chunk of our budget. Um, I think the challenge for us all right now is a recognition that um, everything changed in March. And it not only changed for us in terms of the way we're doing business, it changed for the schools in the way they're doing business. So the schools are no longer providing seven and a half hours a day of face-to-face -face services with their students. They're not providing transportation to and from school for their students. And yet they are trying to work within their um, taxpayer approved budgets um, to continue to draw down the funds in order to keep their teachers in place, to keep their services in place in anticipation of reopening in the fall in some in some fashion or other. And as DAs, we are exactly in the same place. Um, our critical criteria right now is to, on the one hand, solve this short-term problem, which deals with FY20, but also be uh, strongly positioned so that when students come back, we have the staff and the resources to ensure that we can meet their needs. And I'll just reiterate briefly what Mary said that, we already are seeing signs that a lot of the young people that we're serving are gonna need more mental health supports and services. This has been a traumatic experience for those of us that are adults and for children, um, it's even more so because they don't fully understand the intellectual realities of the situation. So I know Sandy McGuire is on, um, I think she's still on. She's the CFO at the agency. I don't know if there's anything specifically in terms of numbers, Sandy, that you wanna just quickly put on the table for folks to consider? Yeah, Sandy. Um, the OA thing, hi everyone, Sandy McGuire from Howard Center. Um, you know, I will um, just reiterate what's been said as far as the um, ability to leverage Medicaid that these dollars give us for, um, as a state. For Howard Center, we're talking in the fourth quarter with the challenges with these contracts, potentially three quarters of a million dollars which leverages $1.8 million in Medicaid. So if we're not able to resolve successfully, not only do we individually as an agency um, have some financial challenges as a result, but as a state, we're leaving significant federal dollars on the table. Um, and there's both the current challenges in this fiscal year and how do we resolve it? But as we look at programming next year, schools, while they anticipate the need, they're hearing and seeing the increased need already, they're reluctant to commit which makes us unable to be able to know what we're doing for staffing and have operations in place. They're looking for assurance that they'll be reimbursed from the AOE. And without that, they're sort of stuck um, in a hard place. The other piece is if going forward, we are in this fee-for-service structure, if you will, with more limited um, opportunities to be able to capture revenue um, and not be able to draw down the Medicaid revenue, it's ultimately gonna increase the cost to the school districts. Um, we're gonna have to increase those rates if we're leaving Medicaid on the table. Uh, there's gonna be a cost shift there that we don't want as a state, I don't believe, uh, to be leaving the federal participation on the table and have to increase one way or another the cost to the, um, to the Vermont taxpayer. I'm sure that somewhere you, you folks have looked at other potential sources for matching funds. Besides, other than the schools, looking looking at other possibly funds that could be used to provide that match. And I'm pretty sure the federal guidelines are probably, Medicaid guidelines are probably fairly strict. You can use some um, uh, local dollars as match. Um, from the schools. Uh, you can use some, some uh, dollars from towns. 
Um, some other revenue streams, United Way and others are potentially eligible. It's nowhere near the level of dollars that come in for the contracts. Yeah. Um, and essentially what we look at, um, the way it breaks down is the contract is paid essentially 60% um, federally and 40% through the school district. So not only does it leverage, but without those dollars, you can't um, draw down the 60% Medicaid, but then if the schools aren't paying, you're left with either 0% of that remaining 40%, or if you're billing fee for service, a much lower amount, which does not support the, the business modeling for these services. Sarita Austin, a retired guidance counselor on our committee. Sarita Austin, do you, did you have a question? Yes, I'm just wondering, this kind of uh, piggybacks on Kate, because we're in a state of emergency, can you um, fill out an application for disaster relief funds for mental health services? I, I don't know if we have anyone from the department that could answer that question. Um, the only disaster relief at this point that we're aware of as a designated agency system is through a FEMA grant, which is uh, a crisis counseling model to provide additional services for our communities. So I'm not aware of uh, disaster okay. relief funds available. I, I thought that I, it might be FEMA, but I thought there were funds for mental health services at, you know, after or during a disaster. So uh, it was just another source. I was just wondering if that might be a possibility. Bill or Brad, do you have anything to add on that? Sorry, I couldn't uh, get the unmute. I don't have anything. Brad, uh, are you aware of anything? There's my unmute. On, on the, uh, I, and I, I have not looked through the CARES Act for anything along those lines. I've seen that there's stuff for businesses. I don't know as you classify as a business that way in that same regard. I, I truly don't know. I do know that as uh, Representative Austin mentioned, there is a FEMA grant. Um, and I think it reimburses, I want to say it reimburses maybe 75% of the cost, something like that. It's, but That's it, right. That does not kick in until after the president declares the emergency over, at which point people then um, apply for it. I, that, I don't know a lot about it, but that's the kind of the gist from my understanding. But I think it is fairly wide ranging as to what those monies can be used for. Peter Conlon, I also want to make sure that we also get to, um, where are you on here? It's Todd. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully, Brad could probably answer this quickly, or maybe Sandy McGuire. I'm just this is complex stuff that I don't particularly understand real well. But what I, I the base problem here is that um, school districts cut back their need because they didn't have school kids in, in school. Um, but at the same time, they're also sort of legally bound not to pay for services that they're not receiving. Is that true? Do they, what's their level of flexibility in this? And I realize that if they aren't paying for services, you can't match and draw down the, the federal dollars. Right, the, the guidance that everyone is referencing is, is the saying basically that, that school districts should be paying for services that they receive. I'm hearing from Washington Mental Health and, and Howard a little bit saying that people are not, that their counseling contracts is something that I had not heard. Um, and so that's, that's, a different, that's, a different, that's a different question to me. Um, but but in term in terms of paying for services that are delivered, I don't think there's any question about that. I believe what what the issue is is that the services are not as uh, what's the word I remember? They're not as long, for lack of a better term. My brain just stopped. Um, so the the service the hours per day are not are not as high. Therefore, they're getting less money. And that the real issue here is that because the LEAs the school districts are not sending their their payments to the um, to the DAs, they're not going to have enough local maths to draw down more Medicaid money. So it's a right. cash problem for them. But the, but the schools basically can't, right? I mean, they, they it, it, can't. This, it, it's it's questionable as to whether legally they can or not. But the way that, the way some of the contracts I've read um, say basically that they should not be paying if the services are not being delivered. Yeah. I'm not aware. Thank you very much. We love, we're supposed to have Emily um, join us, who is one who's legal counsel for yes. 
for the agency and she's not was not able to join us. I don't think she still is. And she's the one that, that wrote the wrote that directive, I believe. Um, Todd. Yeah, Kate, if I could just say, yeah, uh, you know, with all due respect, if there's any attorneys in the room, I uh, don't take this the wrong way, but you get two attorneys, you got three opinions. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think part of the challenge right now is if you read the contracts from one perspective, it in fact says that um, regardless, because it's a bundled relationship for a 12 month period, um, payment is due in the same way that uh, if you have a lease uh, and you decide that because of circumstances, uh, you can't occupy your building for three months, you still have the obligation to pay the lease. Um, on the other side of the equation, there's the interpretation that there are certain constraints as it relates to the to the payer or the secondary payer. And I think the challenge is uh, even in the AOE um, uh, uh, guidance email that went out um, in while it, the, on the one hand, it talked about only paying for the services on a fee for service basis. There was a, a clause that said, except if there may be contract language to the contrary. So that's where it starts to get into the um, pull and tug. Um, I, 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 I agree with that. Um, I, I, I completely agree with that. But the contracts I've read, it, it, it's it, that language is not in there. Yeah. There was well, so I, I yeah. haven't read them all by any means. Yeah, I can't speak to anybody else's contracts. I could tell you it's in our contracts, but um, but I don't think that the goal is to make this, the goal I don't think certainly in our part or the school's part or AOE's part is to make this a win-lose kind of situation. Mm -hmm. It's to try to come up with a solution which meets both uh, the um, legal and obligation responsibilities of the LEA and the AOE Department of Mental Health, um, but also recognizes the fiscal impact um, that it would have on um, the designated agencies and try to come up with a solution that works for everybody. So I think part of the, the reason we're all gathering here today is I think, um, I, I think I certainly wanna see how to make the agency, the, the designated agencies whole, but I also wanna make sure that we're not just dragging the schools deeper into a pit that they're already in. And so we're sitting here with, with this federal money and trying to find a way that we can do this in a way that meets the appropriate criteria to use those funds. And Sarah Squirrel, do we, we have any idea what the total um, suffering that's going on with the designated agencies at this point? Do we have a... Do we, do Sarah we have, needed to jump off, uh, Kate. Oh, she did. Okay. Yeah. Is there, is, um, I do believe it's 12.5, Representative Webb, 12.5 12. 12. 5 million. Yeah, Heidi Hall, who is um, my okay. CFO, gathered that information from all designated agencies, and that's the potential. And that's, you know, unless there's some mitigation through some arrangements that get made down the road here. Um, and those discussions are going on as we speak, so. So that's 12.5 of which 60% could have ultimately be covered by Medicaid. Is that right? Sandy, does that make Sandy, sense? I'd ask if that's the GF. I'm assuming that 12.5 is the general fund. That's the that's general GF. fund. Okay, that's so that's what you're using to to yep. to yep. match. Yeah, that's correct. Medicaid funds. Okay, that's too bad. <laughs> um, Peter, do you have you, do you have your hand up for? Yeah, no. Okay, Todd Bauman. For the welcome. Record. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. For the record, my name is Todd Melman. I'm the executive director at uh, Northwestern Counseling. We serve people in Franklin and Grand Isle counties. And um, you know, just want to echo what other people have said, but I want to put a really fine uh, point on what this means for the people of our community. We are working really closely with our superintendents to try and figure this out. They've taken a stance that they're only allowed to pay for the services that are being provided. So, and we're working with them to find out how can we figure out how to make that work. The, the challenge is, and this makes, as an agency, this makes me really worried and it makes our schools extremely worried for what does this mean when the kids come back to school? We don't have the ability to maintain our infrastructure during this period. 
we know that there's going to be this huge need that is on the other side of this when kids do come back to school, both just through the trauma that's been caused by, by COVID, but also I'll, I'll share, and I don't know if uh, Representative Tube, if you've heard this yet, we just got a call today from both Ben and Jerry's. Uh, they're a large employer that we have here in our community. They said they're seeing a significant increase in depression and substance abuse. Can we do anything at all to jump in and help? And we got a call from our local immigration, which is the largest employer in Franklin County. And we heard that they're laying off 75% of their workforce, that they're only maintaining a workforce of 25% in Franklin County. And they are our largest employer. So we know there's this incredible trauma that's taking place both from COVID directly and secondary from the impacts that COVID's having to these families. And we know, and the schools tell us all the time, they need us to be healthy on the other side of this. And our concern is without some type of additional funds to bridge this gap, we will not have the infrastructure in place um, to provide that need that we know is there. And we know it's coming. We're, we're preparing as there's a second wave, a wave of mental health need that's coming and we're trying to have the infrastructure in place. And we're working really closely again with our school partners on that um, because both of us are very fearful that we won't have the services in place when we need them most. So um, let me just move to Tracy Sawyers for a minute. Um, Cause Tracy, I would imagine um, school districts are also having trouble being able to get uh, special ed dollars is that correct okay. because of the change in the amount of service so they're yeah. missing federal funds as well right so do you want me to give my little testimony here quickly why don't, why don't you do that that'd be great okay. thank you so, tracy sawyer is executive director of the vermont council of special education administrators um and i just want to start by um saying thank you for having this discussion and having us um, and also say how much we value the success beyond six partnerships and what good work the da's have been doing in the last few months um, and always do. But from our, so from our perspective, here's, the, here's how the issue went. It was an issue of concern to my members um, in April, um, mainly and May. And in early April, the field did receive guidance from AOE that encouraged um, the continuation of schools paying for mental health services via their contracts with the DAs. But it didn't address how the AOE was going to handle the reduction in services and existing contracts. So schools were immediately worried about reimbursement. Um, AOE stated that guidance would be forthcoming, and it was in early May that there was additional guidance that acknowledged that some services covered by existing contracts either could not be delivered at all in the remote learning context or could not be delivered with the same frequency or duration. And the guidance said in these cases, unless a specific term in the contract provided otherwise, the guidance quote said, LEA should refrain from paying for any services that the LEA knows were not delivered. Um, so, and I, I wanna be clear that it's true that the use of IDEA funds is not flexible and um, the feds have not relaxed the requirement that IED, IEDA funds be used for the actual provision of services. So, when the second guidance came out, then my members started to renegotiate um, some of the contracts or were thinking that they needed to renegotiate some of the contract. And it's been my understanding that superintendents then largely took over that work. Um, so you'll hear from Jeff Francis after um, me, but, um, and I would just like to say that the contracts are not uniform. So some had to give 60 days, 30 days, just the contracts are all over the place as well. But how I understand, my perspective, how my members have um, described, typically during the regular school year, many school districts um, in Washington County, for example, purchase pods for school-based services. And with the purchase of a pod, the school receives services of a BCBA and contracted number of BIs to support multiple students with IEP goals and objectives. And the BIs are cross-trained to work with various students with, within the district to provide consistency for students and to mitigate the absence of the BIs. And BI being behavioral interventionist. Yes, behavioral interventionist. So in April, a group of my members, so again, there's the special ed administrators um, and school districts learned that school-based BIs had been redeployed to work in other areas of the mental health agency, at least in Washington County. So like micro on micro residential programs, residential or helping with case management responsibilities. Um, to cover duties for employees, the mental health agency um, who felt 
into the, one of the high risk categories. And just we're told that funding was being blended and that the continuation of a school contract permits DAs to bill Medicaid under a more flexible standard than IDEA or Vermont's own special education finance rules. So this was just concerning for VCSEA, especially given the grim reality of the education fund shortfall and that some students being served currently are not eligible for special education services and clearly fall outside the school's responsibility for provision of services. So it seemed to them that it represented a cost shift to local budgets and then came the guidance that LEA should refrain from paying for any of the services um, that LEA know were not delivered. Um, so again, I just want to say it's true that IDEA is not flexible. I think the bottom line is the concern that school budgets could likely rise because schools will pay the contracts but not get reimbursed from AOE. And for taxpayers, it looks like schools aren't being fiscally responsible and rising budgets are often blamed on special education. And this is directly related to special education services um, and in that portion of the budget. So it's just an ongoing concern of the education fund dollars being used to, to fund mental health. And I think just we're in such an economic crisis and um, schools um, are you know, really facing a huge cliff and um, a very significant um, um, hit on funding. So that was really um, our concern. So we talked to um, Dan French right away and he was very open to hearing the concerns and he's been, I know, working back and forth with Sarah on this. Um, but again, we, we extremely value our relationships with the DAs and the service providers. But um, as you say, Kate, nothing is easy related to COVID-19. So from my perspective, that's kind of how this has unfolded over April and um, May and now into June. Thank you, Casey Tooth. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, Chair Webb. Uh, I just wanna to respond to Todd who um, brought up those two uh, potential issues. I did hear about the um, INS. Uh, I have not heard about Ben and Jerry, so I, that's something I will look into as well. Um, but please keep me informed with this stuff too. Um, I think you have my email. I think we've talked before. So thank you for bringing that up. So let's, let's see if we can put this in a nice, neat package. We have um, a global pandemic. Schools were shut down, immediately demonstrating to us what inequity looks like. We can all, if you, you want to see inequity, close the schools. Um, we have our neediest students that are being served in different ways. Um, you have, there are contracts between the schools and the designated agencies um, to provide various supports, whether it's case management or it's behavioral interventionists or it's one-on-one -on -one or, or a variety of of things that you provide. However, those hours have been drastically cut because of the change in program. So they don't necessarily need help to walk through the halls anymore to get to the cafeteria or to get to another class. Um, they don't need someone sitting with them in the in circle to, to keep them focused. Um, so we have reduced hours, which means reduced funds which means potentially harming the designated agencies. And we can't use the funds that we normally would have used to pay for those services because they're reduced, which therefore cuts down the access to um, Medicaid funds. In the meantime, we have this big pot of gold sitting over here, which is the CRF funds. And we have not yet figured out a way how to legitimately use those to be able to keep the agencies whole, to be able to draw down those funds. And we need, we need some serious thinking here because we're certainly hearing that this is a challenge for the schools. Um, the schools are not banks. Um, we have, we have budgets going down um, because of, of the introduction of, of um, global pandemic. And we have this pot of money. <laughs> and I need some ideas on how we can access that money to be able to keep 
the agencies hold to be ready for the fact that we know that the students returning in the fall are gonna look different and be needier. Um, that we already know. Um, I went on a walk with four teachers the other day and they said, you wanna see learning loss? I got it, I'll show you. So we know that. So um, ideas, how do we, how do we, how can we use that money in a way that um, meets the criteria um, and helps us be prepared for, for the return? Peter Conlon, do you have the answer, I hope? Not even close. Uh, this is, this. We, we clearly need, um, you know, minds that understand this much better than we do um, as just elected citizens, because it's complex. Uh, I just had a, a question though, and that is, um, you know, did the DAs uh, see a reduction in expenses as a result? I don't think they were under the same order to keep their employees employed uh, as the public schools were. Um, and uh, somebody mentioned the concern about staffing up for needs in the fall. And I just would like somebody to expand on that. If, if somehow the staff disappeared and, and you don't expect it to reappear or if it actually never really went anywhere and there will be enough on staff. I, I'd be happy to speak to that representative Conlon on the, uh, we were strongly encouraged actually to keep our staff uh, employed. And that was uh, from the very beginning with uh, meetings with secretary, with, with Secretary Mike Smith. So um, we, took, we took that on at Washington County for sure across all populations. And there was mention of a redeployment um, by Tracy, which was seven individuals and an unfortunate uh, conclusion by our district, which we've tried to rectify that for some reason, the kids still weren't getting, those kids weren't getting services. We just shifted their, um, we shifted their needs to other workers, but we did move seven workers from children's into our residential children's facilities. So we maintained, because we had so many vacancies as well, we maintained our staff across and we were encouraged to do so strongly by our secretary. Uh, so they, they moved into positions where their, their salaries or whatever would be reimbursed. Yep, those seven, and that those are areas where we have said we'd we'd be you know within the contract con structure, we'd be very willing to sit down and discuss concessions. Um, our district is one of those that has indicated that they believe that the contract is null and void, and so um, you know we are having some contractual discussions around that. Yeah, contention. I, I guess, Kate, this is more a question for you. You know, this is a or this is, this is actually a technical question. So let's say we say, okay, this is really a human services problem and the human services committee comes up with a way to fund this $12 million. Does, does that still, does that negate the ability to draw down the federal money? If we just sort of throw $12 million at you without it being funneled through the schools and school services? Not if it's 12 million of general fund. 12 million of ge just general funds would, would do it. Mm -hmm. um, but not 12 million of CRF funds. Oh, no. oh, not 12 million of CRF funds. Okay. Okay. Um, All right. So we need, to, we need a way to get general fund money in there and then replace that in the general fund with CRF funds. I just saw a member from appropriations <laughs> face. <laughs> what? <laughs> but one, one question I, I just want to get to is how is it affecting how, what what are the effects that you are you are experiencing with this lack of, of money? What's what's what what's the the problem? I can speak from our agency as we yeah. we we entered this with about 30, 35 days of cash. Um, where our our um, someone asked uh, our do, we are still accruing the expenses of those employees because they're still doing some type of work, um, and we kept them under the um, kind of auspices that we would be reimbursed for that. Um, we made that decision in mid-March going forward. And I know DOE's decision, AOE's decision or recommendation to only pay for the services you've, you've been received 
came out um, significantly later than that. So we had already accrued a significant amount of expense um, for that time period. We're burning through our cash. Um, I, I know we are, are very quickly going to go into our capital um, fund, which is our, our um, we're going to shift capital dollars into operating dollars. And we project without some type of help, we're going to eat through all of those dollars as well. Um, so we are very worried about that. I, I um, you know, we have a, I've been briefing my board on this regularly, keeping them in the loop. Um, we are now looking seriously at how do we decrease our expenses um, as a way to kind of right size us given the significant reduction in revenue that we had planned on having that we don't have now. So is it staffing that you're trying to cover that's, that's breaking the bank? Uh, staff is about 80% of our expenses are, are, are staff wage. So anytime we look to save, to reduce our overall expense, it has to include some type of staffing reduction. Okay. What about for you, Bob Dick? What's what's breaking the bank? Is it staff costs? Sandy, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, it's the same for Todd as far as what we're looking at for the current fiscal year, and we're similarly about eighty percent is staffing costs. But I would offer that the dollar amounts that we're talking about right now are for fiscal twenty, right? We're talking about from March forward or May forward, depending on which date that you're looking at. And the other problem with this, besides the current financial one, is what's going to happen going forward. The way these um, contracts are devised, it is, as Mary mentioned, it's a package of services. So we're offering you board certified behavior analysts. We're offering you clinical specialists, behavior interventionists. There's multiple uh, resources that go to this. And again, the primary issue in this challenge is the behavior interventionist. But there are a lot of services, crisis intervention, living skills training, homeschool coordination, Schools sign a contract for this, they pay whatever it is, say it's $3,000 a month to have that capacity in place. If going forward, what they believe is happening is that they can only bill fee for service. There's no, we don't bill fee for service for the schools for this right now. There's a capacity of staff available to support them. And in some of these contracts, it also includes consultation um, and training for the school partners, for the teams, et cetera. But we don't log that currently. It doesn't say we'll give you X hours of this, Y hours of that. And so if moving forward, there's not a resolution on how they're gonna be reimbursed. And again, nothing has changed in this as far as the contract they signed, they were getting reimbursed before. Um, there was no guarantee of certain hours. Again, it's sort of a resource level overall. And then the uh, memo that came out said, if there was any reduction in services, don't pay, pay fee for service. And so as they look at, we met with the Chittenden County Special Educators this morning and excellent partners. Um, we're all working together to try to resolve this, but they are rightly very nervous about signing contracts for next year. Even if school is fully in session and stays fully in session, and we're all trying to uh, plan the multiple strategies on both sides for how that might look different. Um, but if it's gonna be a fee for service model, how that is going to work um, uh, is not gonna work on their end if they're not getting reimbursed and it's not gonna work on our end if we're not getting the 3000 a month that it takes to support these services and now just have to bill out a subset of services, fee for service hit by hit. If you had 12.5 million distributed with general funds, then you could access the, the Medicaid funds. Is that accurate? The 12.5 million is the current challenge for the current fiscal year. For FY20. For fiscal 21, uh, my estimate is we're talking, yeah, it's, I think we're 62 million overall as a system. Um, 62 million is, is, what is 62 million? Uh, the total size of the Success Beyond Six program across okay. the state for a year. That's not the loss, that's the. Correct, correct. That's the total that's the budget. So when we're talking about the 12 million, those are the education dollars yeah. currently for the current fiscal year. Um, again, I'm concerned that even if, and, and I think this is incredibly challenging to come up with $12 million in general fund for this year, but again, it's just going to lead to a, a, a bigger issue for the coming year um, if we can't solve the reimbursement for the, for the districts, or it's going to create another shift to um, general fund that is scarce. Peter Conlon. Uh, just a quick te technical question. Um, we keep saying money from the general fund, but I assume the same is true if it's the coming from the education fund. 
use them interchangeably. Okay. The education fund, which has a hundred million, <laughs> that's missing at the moment. Um, better than 150. Okay, so the moment I'm not seeing a solution um, to this, we are going to hear, from, I will try to hear from the agency, agency of Education. Um, I know that we were supposed to have Heather, Heather Boucher and um, Emily Simmons, but they were not able to join us. But I think what they're probably going to say is exactly what you told me that they said. Um, there's part of that that makes sense uh, in terms of asking schools to pay for services that weren't rendered um, when they don't have money. So that's a challenge. Um, Brad, Chloe, is Chloe in the room? Chloe usually figures these things out. Did she leave? Chloe, do you have any Kate, thoughts? Kate, yeah. I'm here. Um, I don't have, I ha I, I'm, I'm listening and yeah. thinking and learning. Yeah. And, um, and I know, I mean, I know, I, I do believe that there are other committees thinking about this. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think Stephanie Barrett in our office is working um, with some senators on it as well. Okay. So um, I will keep my ears to the ground. Yeah. We can't use the code, we can't use the CRF money to match. It has to be state dollars, state or local. Um, and we can't justify it. Um, it goes back to our hundred million. So um, is Brad, not Brad, Brad is, is uh, Mark in the room? No, I don't think he's in the room. Others, ideas? I, I wonder um, what we really have here is a contract dispute. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is this going to get settled in court if we can't figure out a solution legislatively? So Washington County Mental Health is, you do have a lawsuit going, correct, Mary? Uh, no, no, we have uh, conversations at this point that have escalated between two attorneys, okay. but um, we would really very much like to get to sit down and have the discussion, really want to just sit down. Um, Jim Demeray, just checking with you um, to see if you see any options for us. I don't, uh, Chair Webb, I, this is the first time I'm hearing of this as well, I'm not familiar with it. Um, so like Chloe, I'm just you know, listening and learning at this stage. And Mary Hooper from Appropriations. You have a magic 12.5? No, that's the reason we asked you to take this up. And <laughs> I, I really want to say thank you um, for taking it up at the last moment on a long day and a long week, et cetera. Um, I think it's a problem that we need to figure out how to solve. It would be a real shame to say, oh, it's a contract dispute, because I think there are larger issues here, which I know you all are just deeply aware of and I so admire your dedication to the kids that we're trying to support through this process. Um, there is another associated piece, which is that we're trying to move our healthcare system to a fee for service way of thinking. And it sure would be a shame if, if the education system said we don't want to be part of delivering healthcare to kids in that same way. And I just I just wanted to give a nod to the value of dealing with fee-for-service because of what it gets for the whole system. Um, I, I, think, I think maybe we need the weekend to think about it. I've been texting or emailing with Stephanie Barrett, um, so maybe we just need the thinking caps of the JFO folks 
Um, and hopefully, I mean, those poor people are working hard, as hard as everybody else, yeah. on, you know. So and, thank you. And Chloe, you're in conversation with Stephanie as well. Can I just clarify something? Mary Hooper, you said the value of fee-for-service and moving toward fee-for-service? No, away from. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, why are you? That's, that's yeah. what I thought. Thank you okay. for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're trying desperately to move away from fee-for-service. Thank you. To, um, uh, yes, I beg your pardon. It's a Thank long day. Friday afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, in, in our Act 173, we're trying to, trying to move away from that as well. Right. Um, we just are struggling getting there. Um, this did not help. Uh, Serena, it sounds I, to me like right, yeah. right now, it's either we force school districts to pay the money or we don't, as, as that, the obvious answers. Say that again? That, I mean, the, the easy answer here is something that forces school districts to honor the contracts that solves the problem but obviously that's a very problematic solution so the it's i feel like we have kind of a binary choice at least at this moment in time we either force school districts to pay so we can get the match and the da's are made whole or we don't well we do have two business managers in the room i see rick pembroke and randa fleming are in the room how does that sound to you guys that sound good Either of you, yeah, Brenda? I kind of wish I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter was suggesting that we perhaps force the school districts to pay. No, 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 I wasn't suggesting that. I was just saying <laughs> that that seems to be the only option to solve the problem at this moment in time. Uh, Sandy? Brenda's my constituent. I gotta, I, I gotta talk carefully with her. <laughs> I think the biggest question that I don't have the answer to, but I would, you know, want us to kind of fold that through is, um, you know, what does that mean in regards to the match? Because we do know that the full amount of services aren't happening. Does that put the mental health people in, in a bad, bad, worse or different situation? And um, I know you are the people who can write the legislation that says you still make the school district whole. So I wouldn't say offhandedly it's a bad idea, um, but, but I think I'd like to just, not from my point of view, but from the mental health agencies, what, what that means from them in regards to their matches. That would be my, my thoughts. If the, schools were forced, if the schools were forced to pay, I believe our agencies would be fine. I believe there would be unintended consequences on the local school budgets because their challenge is getting the reimbursement from the AOE. Typically, they get reimbursed for this contract from the AOE. Again, it doesn't specify a certain level of services. It specifies a capacity. And I want to be clear, it is not that there has been no service provision. There just hasn't been the same level of service provision because the students haven't been as available. And so what muddied the waters, typically, they were all on board to continue, at least in our region, to continue to pay these contracts until the guidance came out that said, if there has been uh, a change in the frequency or duration of services, then only pay fee for service unless there is specific contract language. So now everybody's running around to look at the contract language and et cetera. But I would suggest that forcing them to pay them is going to solve our problem, create a bubble elsewhere in the local school budgets. And I'm seeing Tracy because that's going to yes. get us in trouble with special ed. Yeah. I'm, I'm Rick Pembroke, I'm the Chief Financial Officer in Springfield. Yeah, I, I concur. It sounds like an unfunded mandate that's going to um, balloon out of control and we'll be dealing with it at the ballot box and the local local property taxes, which isn't a pretty conversation right now. I think I must have misunderstood because I think Peter was saying by the legislature mandating it, they would also make sure that we received reimbursement. He didn't say that, please. I'm pretty sure <laughs> he wasn't going to just mandate one-sided. All right, it's 4.53. Um, my email is available. Um, if you think of something, um, Last weekend, I was 
you know, losing sleep over one thing, I might as well lose sleep over this. Um, I want, want, to, want to solve it. Just not seeing the avenue yet, but boy, there's just got to be a way. I don't know. Kate, it seems like every day there's a new problem and a new issue, and they just keep getting more severe. Yeah. Chair Webb, can I just ask yeah, please, if yeah. hypothetically um, there was another, another pot of money coming from the federal government and we were able to use that to backfill lost revenue, so we made the education fund whole, then would we be able, I mean, I know this is a hypothetical, but I'm just wondering, then could, would we be able to pay this, pay the 12 point whatever million? If we had fewer restrictions on the way we use the money, um, okay. that would make a difference. Oh, wait a minute, ESSER funds. Yeah, there's some ESSER funds. ESSER funds, Chloe? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Chloe. I'll, I'll, I'll jump on ESSER funds because just what I've been hearing from various legislative committees, including yours, is a different use for ESSER funds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Aware of that? Yeah. Just throwing that out there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, hard. Not my decision, but. Yeah, yeah. We have to think about that, don't we? Um, I think I think that's it for now. Um, Jim Demeray, if you could, I'll maybe I'll see if we can talk um, either over the weekend on Monday to talk about the language um, to address the the um, independent schools. I think I've got enough for us to draft something. So let me okay. draft something to get to you and, and a few other people and just we'll have something to look at when we. Yeah, I mean, if they could, it's just to cover, it's just to cover 2020 20 and FY20 20 and 21. Yeah. Yep. If there's a way to put them together, that'd be great. I think you can carry over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it looks like. Um, let's see, we've got Mary in the room. I don't think that we have Chip in the room, but uh, we'll just say that we're not seeing a way to use, um, we're not seeing a, a purpose for the um, chart of accounts money. I know that that was something of interest to the committee. We're not, I, I don't think we're gonna give you anything on that. <laughs> I, I, I got that very quickly. Thank you for asking the question. I'm sorry to have put you through it. But we have to ask the question. I know. So I'll report back. We so want it, don't we? Yeah. Can we just get it done? Can we just get it done? The answer is no. Right. Yeah, this way. <laughs> um, I think that's it. I want to thank you all so much for coming. I apologize for um, the way the legislature functions, we uh, we we don't know we are not always able to control the time because we have a, a process by which people everybody gets to speak on the floor related to the issue before us. And as one legislator said years ago, uh, not everything has been said. It just not has not been said by everyone. And we had a little bit of that today, I think. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks everyone for being yeah. here. Have a Thank weekend. you. Got ideas. Have a great weekend.